Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Joshua Green. Mr. Green is a renowned Holocaust scholar and filmmaker whose biography has sold more than half a million copies worldwide. And today we are here to talk about his latest book, Unstoppable, Siggy Wilsick's Astonishing Journey from Aus Auschwitz Survival and Penniless Immigrant to Wall Street Legend. Mr. Green, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rob. So, uh, Mr. Green, I really love your book, and uh, I, I also love that we have real pictures so many times. <laughs> I'm still a child in my head, and I always get excited when I see photos, images, uh, illustrations. <laughs> so that, that, that helped to capture my interest, and it's a remarkable story. And this is the kind of a story that gives us hope that everything, anything is possible. And, you know, no matter from where you come from or no matter what the circumstances in your life, we can all make it happen. Uh, I would like to start the interview with uh, asking you a little bit about your background. You are in, yeah, you have written many biographies. You have written, according to my Amazon uh, research, I think nine books and what is it, uh, eight of them for children? Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into filmmaking, how you got into writing books? Um, when I was a teenager, I went to India. That's my thing. My thing is India. My thing is yoga. I saw that in your children's book, <laughs> four of them are about India and I was just trying to figure out how that happened. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, like other, I'm 70 years old. Like other people my age, I was a lost child of the 60s, you know. So I dropped out of college, went to India, uh, went on a journey, tried to find my soul, came back and got very lucky because in 1969, I went to London and ended up recording with George Harrison. We studied with the same yoga teacher in London. And uh, I came back to the United States after living in ashrams for many years. And, uh, you know, didn't have any job skills. I mean, you know, there was no call in the corporate world for chanting Sanskrit mantras. You know? So naturally, without any talent, uh, I went into academia and <laughs> finished my degree. And I've been teaching. So I teach. Uh, my late father-in-law, Alan Fortunoff, uh, was a very philanthropic man. He endowed the Yale University Holocaust video archive. And my privilege was to have studied Holocaust history with the scholars uh, at the archive at Yale. And um, I had had some background doing children's films. So they asked me to help them make documentaries. And that was really the start of things back in the 1990s. And I'd been teaching Holocaust and writing biographies of uh, witnesses to the Holocaust ever since then. So that's a brief overview. Okay, so, and can you tell us some of the titles of the books that you have written? Because I saw many of them very appealing and yes, I know how many, how, after all, how many titles are there? I counted to get all together, what, 11? I've lost count. <laughs> okay. So give us three of your most popular titles. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Um, there was a book about war crimes trials called Justice at Dachau. The American Third Army set up its military commissions at the end of World War II on the grounds of former concentration camp Dachau. So while the chieftains of the Nazi party were being tried 65 miles north at Nuremberg, the people who operated the concentration camps, the guards, the torturers, the Gestapos, the people who did the beatings and the humiliations, they were on trial south of Nuremberg at Dachau. So this is about the war crimes trials that took place there, justice at Dachau. And then there were biographies of Holocaust survivors for Scholastic, uh, for uh, um, Simon & Schuster, and then uh, my wife saw me in a depression from all of this darkness. So she said, you've got to find something else to write about. So uh, I said, like what? She said, well, why don't you write a biography of George Harrison? 
you met George Harrison, you recorded with him. You always have nice things to say about him. So I did. It's called Here Comes the Sun. And that was a pleasure. That was just joy. That was pure light, you know. So then about eight years ago, the telephone rings and uh, a voice at the other end of the phone says, oh, Mr. Green, you know, I've read some of your books. I think you should write a story about my father. I said, well, tell me about him. Said, well, my father was a survivor of Auschwitz and uh, death marches. I said, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you for your compliments, but I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with the darkness. No more darkness. And the voice on the other end of the line screams at me. He says, you don't understand. <laughs> my father was a beacon of light. There was no darkness. He, he, he was a candle of hope for every immigrant who ever came to America. He, and he went on and on and on. So I researched it and I found out that uh, Ivan, this was the late Sigur Rosen's son, was not exaggerating. His father was an amazing man. He came here at age 21 with nothing, no education, no money. Uh, and by the time he died in 2003, he left behind an oil and banking empire with more than $4 billion <laughs> in assets. So I said, you know what? This is a story that should be told. So. I, you know, I'm so amazed that I never heard the story of Stiggy Wilsick. I mean, I am a devout uh, market follower. I read the business news almost daily. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is almost like my Bible. And I just don't know how come I never heard about uh, Stiggy before. Well, he, he was very well known uh, in the oil industry, in the banking industry. Everybody knew Stiggy Wilsick. He was this legend who had built up a trust company bank from uh, two branches to a hundred branches and turned around Wilshire Oil of Texas. He was very well known in the investor community. He was very well known by the, you know, the stockbrokers and so on. Because you got to remember back in those days, the 70s and 80s, there was no internet. If there had been an internet, the whole world would have right, known, right, would have right. known about him. He was amazing. I, so I, I did about a hundred interviews family, friends, former employees, officers of the bank, uh, executives, uh, friends, people who knew him uh, from the war years, uh, from places where he lectured, they all had the, they all remembered him as being a volcano of a man. He was very short, like five foot five, small guy. Right. But they all talk about him like a giant. You know? So uh, he was very well known in this time. And maybe this book will help to make him a little bit <laughs> okay, well, he arrived December 12, 1947, 21 years old, I guess full of optimism. He's happy to be alive. Everything in his life was paradise. Uh, and he goes into a hotel room. Can you just tell us a little bit more what happened in, in, in his life? Um, immigrants coming from uh, post-war Europe, uh, the Jewish immigrants were put up by the Hebrew Immigrant Aid uh, Association, HIAS. And uh, they had rooms for them in an old hotel on 103rd Street and Broadway called Hotel Marseille. And it, for most of these people coming out of Hitler's Europe, it was the first time they had a room to themselves. So here's this 21 year old in the middle of the worst snowstorm in 50 years. It was a terrible winter. He's looking down from the window of this room. And like you said, even though maybe we would say it was, it was horrible, for him it was paradise. Now he had come out of the worst imaginable hell, you know, where there was no food and torture and starvation and beatings and seeing people killed every day. Uh, the worst thing for, for Siggy was seeing children march to their death. You know, that, he was a very deeply religious man, but that w was a, a bone of contention between him and the Almighty. He said, uh, God and I, we have a complicated relationship you know, because of the children who died. But he's looking down from the window of his room in the uh, Hotel Marseille, and he's thinking, these people, they don't know how good they've got it. None of these people here in America have been inside a concentration camp. They just don't know. So he made three promises, three vows. He said, I'll never go hungry again. I will raise a family and support the Jewish people. And if I ever see injustice, I will speak up. 
I will never hold back. I will always speak up against injustice. And he did it. He, he, he fulfilled all his vows. Elie Wiesel uh, uh, engaged him to help build the Washington Holocaust Museum. He became a leading spokesperson for Holocaust remembrance and uh, 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 speaking out against Holocaust denial. And uh, he was very charitable, very philanthropic. And uh, boy, did he have a sense of humor. He had a wicked sense of humor because he loved his life. So he could joke about things. You know? He, 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 sometimes in the middle of a restaurant, he'd get up and he'd start singing and dancing. If I was a rich man, do doodle, 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 doodle. And people would ask his family, is, it, is that the owner of the restaurant? <laughs> and they say, no, no, he just loves his life. That's all. That's the kind of man he was. Do you have any idea what was the U.S. stance towards accepting you, Jewish immigrant or Holocaust survivors at that time? Well, there were quotas. Um, it, it wasn't an open door policy. There were only so many immigrants that were being allowed in. Um, Siggy benefited from two programs. One was the fact that after liberation from Camp Mauthausen by the American army, he volunteered to become a Nazi hunter. And he worked with the US uh, counterintelligence corps. And he was so good at his job that he brought in a lot of uh, former concentration camp guards and officers. He tracked them down and brought them to justice. And he turned them over to the Office of Counterintelligence and they were brought to trial. So he got a special uh, visa for those two years of service. So that got him into the, the country on the one hand. Then there were also, of course, in those days, some allotment for young people. And he was still uh, 21 considered a young person. So he, he benefited from that as well. And, uh, but when he came here, uh, almost his entire family had been destroyed. 59 members of his family, he calculated later, had been murdered by the Nazis. And he saw it. He saw his mother go off to the uh, gas chambers and his five and seven year old nephew and niece. So, you know, he had those nightmares all his life. But he always thanked his American liberators, and he always said, thank God for America. People asked him, do you think you could have accomplished what you did anywhere else? He said, no, only in America. That for him was the America. That's the America that I grew up with, you know? the America of opportunity, the place where uh, would have, no matter how humble your background, you have opportunity. Do you think? Some people or many people are not taking advantage of all the opportunities that are in America. And I tell you, I'm, and I'm, I am an immigrant as well. I came to Canada, but I have been in the U.S. And some of the words that I came to my mind when I came here is uh, these people don't know how good they have it. <laughs> so some of the some of, uh, the same phrase that uh, Sigi used, uh, they don't know how good they have it. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe immigrants have this resilience. They have survived whatever difficult circumstances and they self-selected themselves to come here looking for, I don't know, bigger, they have bigger ambitions and, and they make it happen. And sometimes Americans don't take advantage of all the opportunities available to them. I think you're right. Uh, Alan, you're, you're absolutely correct there. Um, I know for myself, look, I'm a white American. You know, I grew up in New York. I had a good education. I, I have my health. You know, I've got access to good uh, medicine and, and uh, food. And uh, so I know I live a privileged life. Um, but working in the arena of uh, Holocaust testimonies, you really get a, a perspective on um, the majority of the world. Not everybody has the, the, those privileges. And Siggy knew that. He knew that very, very well. He knew that coming here, he was being given an opportunity. And he grabbed it. He, he you know, it, he, if he were here today, let me put it this way. If he were here today, what he would say is, um, never underestimate your good fortune in being here. And don't think, he says, that if you're not Jewish, don't think that my story doesn't apply to you. Don't think that this doesn't, have any relevance because you're a Catholic or you're an atheist or you're Protestant or whatever, this applies to you as well. 
Look, Alan, you, you may remember uh, from January 6th, the film footage of the rioters storming the Capitol building, the man with that T-shirt with the word Camp Auschwitz printed on his uh, sweatshirt, you know, with the death thing. Racism, anti-immigration, anger, anti-Semitism, they're at the root of the, the hatred and the vitriol that we've been seeing around us for a long time now. And uh, I think Siggy would have wanted us to be aware of that. I think he'd wanted us, want us to speak up, to never be bystanders. You know, if we learn anything from the Holocaust, it's that people who stood by and did nothing sided with the perpetrators, not with the victims. So we have an obligation when we, as Siggy knew, that if we see people being harmed because they're from a minority group or underrepresented or whatever, don't, don't hold back. You know, be like Siggy, you know, be an upstander. <laughs> step, step forward and speak up. And he did that all his life. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that he was undereducated. Uh, and as far as I know, in the Jewish tradition, there's a lot of emphasis on education. So how come he was not better educated? The, uh, the Nazi party by the mid to late 1930s were passing edicts. You know, there, there were the Nuremberg Laws, which one by one stripped Jews, primarily Jews, but also other minorities, of their um, legal and civil rights. So um, there were hundreds of these uh, let laws passed that Jews could not own bicycles. Jews could not own radios. Uh, Jews uh, could not uh, work in uh, German businesses. And Jewish children could no longer attend school. So by the time Siggy was uh, 10, 11 years old, uh, there were no schools open to him. So, um, you know, for a guy with only a grade school education and $200 to come to America and become uh, a, a leading voice in Holocaust education and the head of two publicly traded corporations with worth more than $4 billion in assets, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. It's not. And uh, how, how did he learn English? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> there was no TV at that time, no internet either. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had a facility for language in, in the camps in Auschwitz. He picked up some, you know, he spoke German. German was his native language right. when I was growing up. He learned Polish, he learned some uh, Russian, he learned, he had a facility, he had a knack for languages. So that by the time, remember also he was working two years for the U.S. Counterintelligence Corps, and he picked it up very quickly. And uh, when he came here, um, he, like you, he liked reading the Wall Street Journal. You know, he read the business papers and he always watched documentary films. Loved documentary films. The television was set to the History Channel. He watched everything that came out about the Holocaust. And he was a self-taught man. People told me, and I've seen him now on, you know, recorded videos of talks that he gave. He was Shakespearean. He was a powerhouse, he was a very powerful speaker for a little guy in a booming voice, booming. And, and he used his arms to great advantage, you know, and he was like he was on stage, you know, <laughs> like a wow. Shakespearean actor. Very, very dramatic, unforgettable character. Okay, so he comes, uh, he arrived to New York, he has $200, $240 in his pocket and he earned his first dollar shoveling snow. Can you tell us uh, when he was in the need to start earning money, how, how he managed? Sure, he, 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 there was, he had a friend in the camps named Larry and he pro promised Larry when he came to New York, he'd try to find Larry's parents. And he found them and he told them how they survived. And uh, Larry's father got him his first job because across the street from his home in the Bronx, there was a snow up to the rooftop in front of a, a drugstore. So he was shoveling snow. By the way, he found two kids. <laughs> he was being given a dollar a day to shovel snow. He found two kids. He gave them a quarter each. So <laughs> he was already thinking like a businessman. Without doing anything, he was earning money. His next job was uh, cleaning toilets in, in sweatshops. 
So you can imagine from, from those beginnings, shoveling snow and cleaning toilets, and then he went to, he graduated, right, to selling neckties. He bought a used car, went around uh, the country selling neckties out of the trunk of his car. And then with a little bit of money of the commissions that he earned, he started buying stocks. He would read in the papers. He taught himself how to judge what a company was doing. He found a sleepy little oil company called Wilshire Oil. And he studied up and realized it was an old school uh, board of directors. They had no energy, no interest in upgrading or modernizing their bank, their, their, their oil company. So he got his friends and neighbors to go in with him and buy stock, buy stock, buy stock. One share, two shares, three shares, until they had 17% of the, of the stock in this oil company. <laughs> and then he went and he met with the directors and he said, gentlemen, do not be afraid. I am not here for a hostile takeover. I'm here to make you more money than you ever made and to make ourselves, me and my fellow shareholders, money as well. And then he, he had a gimmick. He roll up his sleeve and he points his prisoner number tattooed on his arm in Auschwitz. And he would say, you have met a man who had the last person to try to intimidate me was Hitler and no one will ever do it again. So you need not be concerned. I'm gonna fight for your rights and, 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 and your uh, benefit and our own. And he won them over, you know. And uh, even though there was prejudice of oil and banking were very anti-Semitic industries back then, he showed them that he had skills. He had they called them fox-like instincts. What helped kept kept them alive in the camps, and then he helped build his fortune. Again. Okay, so you attribute a great part of his success not only to his ambition and his optimism, but he had this instinct to see business opportunities as opposed to learning in, learning it in a textbook. Uh, so that's. That's how he, um, I guess, managed so much success. Yeah, well, you know, he had no formal training in oil right. or banking. He knew nothing about oil or banking. Not a thing, nothing at all. But he had this way of studying people. And he would look at some. And, and if they said, you know, uh, Mr. Wilzig, we, we've, sp we've sputted this, this well. Sputting is, you know, you drill a test hole. And if you get a decent quantity of oil and gas, then it's worth investing money in, in developing. So he looked at them, and, and if you saw that they were really convinced, you know, that they believed it, and they had the information, and, and he felt that he can trust them, he would say, okay, go, go ahead, I'll give you the money. So it wasn't based on the numbers. You know, he, right. he didn't know the science behind it, but he had this intuition about people. Oh, and Alan, I, we have to be careful about something. Uh, this is a controversial area in Holocaust studies. Can we say that this person survived and that person didn't survive because this person had um, more cunning, um, more intuitions? I, I, don't, I don't think we can do that. It, it may contribute. It may have contributed to survival. I, I believe he said that the Almighty gave me these ideas. So he credited God. But I'll tell you a quick story. Some people here on Long Island where I live came to me for advice on a film they wanted to do about Long Island survivors, survivors who came to live here after the war. I said, so show me something about it. And he showed me a piece of paper. It said, these people embody the human spirit. They're the, the, they're the nobility of the will to survive and they're heroes. Oh, anyway, time out, wait a minute. So the six, let me get this right. So the six million who died, they didn't have the will to live. They didn't have the nobility of human spirit. They, they weren't heroes. That's your idea? See, the, the fact is, you talk to the survivors, they don't talk themselves as being heroes. They talk about all the unheroic things they had to do just to stay alive. Right, right. You know? And, and uh, so when we talk like that, I think it's more, it says more about ourselves and our desire to find some some kind of a meaning in this than about what actually happened in history. Because if we can't find meaning, then what was it all for? It was, it was meaningless. Um, so we just have to be a little careful, you know, because survivals will say it was luck. You yes. go this way, you go that way. You never knew. Even Siggy. Siggy said, I didn't know. 
what I, if what I did, there was one guard who uh, was a drunken killer. And he says, um, um, who knows how to sing? Sing me a song. Now the, the prisoners were all scared to death of, of singing. But Siggy said, if, if I don't sing, somebody doesn't sing, he's going to kill us anyway. So he stands up and he starts singing, roll out the barrels and dancing. And the guards, you know, keeping beaten at the end, it gives him a slice of bread. A slice of bread can save your life. But Siggy says to his interviewer, what if he didn't like my singing? Right. You know, he could have killed me, could have killed him. So you never knew. Right. It's what scholar Lawrence Langer called choiceless choice. This is not good and that's not good. You never knew. There's something that Siggy had that many of us, including myself, aspire to have, have more of, which is either, I don't want to call it self-confidence, but the appearance of self-confidence. For example, going back to the, the oil company and with the support of his, I don't know, friends, or even approaching his friends and say, let's buy the stock of this company. And, and and we will do something about it. I feel like many of us have ideas, grandiose ideas of how we can do this and the other thing, but we don't have the self-confidence to take that first step of making that phone call, of approaching a person, of proposing a business deal, even to expressing our dreams. And I wonder how, and I, I guess you wouldn't know the answer, but how we can get a little bit more of that self-confidence that Siggy had to propose ideas and and just have that optimism to believe that something could happen. Well, first of all, the title of the book says it all, Unstoppable. I mean, that was him. He was unstoppable. There was nothing, you know, when, you, when you've when survived the Gestapo, you know, nothing's gonna stop you, right? So, so there was that. Also, I, I think the, the Siggy, if, if Siggy, if you were asking Siggy that question, he would say, you can do more than you can imagine. You can do so much more than you think you're capable of doing. If your cause is just, if you're fighting, you know, his favorite song, his theme song in his life was the impossible dream, you know, you know, and I know that if I only be true to this glorious quest, you know, I'll, I'll lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. If, if, if your cause is noble, not just selfish. You know, Siggy, see, sure, Siggy liked money, but he, he wasn't working for money. Money was a means to an end for him. Money was a way to rebuild the Jewish people. It was a way to fund educational programs. You know, if, if your motive is pure, then there are resources that will come to your aid that you can't even imagine. That was, I think, Sir Edmund Hillary, the first person to climb Mount Everest, who said, it's after you make the commitment that these resources have some place to come to. So you have to make the first step. If you don't make the first step, no matter how much resources there are in the universe, they don't know where to go to. So you make that commitment, you make that first step, and then watch the magic happen. Do you think we have been submitted into compliance? I mean, the life script that I read somewhere is that you go to school, you get a good job, you obey orders, and then you can retire. And Siggy, for example, he decided to just become an entrepreneur, seek other opportunities on his own. He got two kids to do the snow shoveling for himself instead of complying to the, the system that was given to him. So, uh, are we too more com uh, too compliant and lack imagination on how we can create a better world? Boy, you ask good questions. Uh, <laughs> this, one, this is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, that's a complicated, that's a very, very complicated issue. Um, it, it's a very cynical world out there. You know, it, it's... Um, it's a world that will do, I, I have a, a, a poem hanging on my wall. It's a quote from the poet E.E. E. Cummings. And the poem says, to do your best day and night when the entire world is doing everything it can to beat you down. 
is to fight the hardest battle any human being can fight and never stop fighting. So first you have to know who you are. You know, when, 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 uh, when I teach classes and, and uh, students ask me how can they get published or how can they get into the film business or whatever, I say, the first thing you gotta do is stop coveting getting published and getting into the film business. Why don't you go live your life first? You know, why don't you get to know yourself a little better before you start having ambitions about what you're gonna do? How do you know what you should do unless you know who you are? So for me, it took, it took the form of going to India. I had to go on a spiritual journey, you know, and, and I had to find a teacher and, and I had to start chanting mantras and doing yoga and meditation. And, you know, that gave me a barometer by which to make the decisions in my life. If something was consonant with who I am, who I consider myself to be, then I can, I can do it with a whole heart. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of very miserable millionaires. You know, I know people with a lot of money, and they're so sad, they're so miserable because they don't like their life. Wow. So, and then I know other people, they don't have much at all, but they're so happy, you know, and they're such good people. You know, it doesn't take a lot. You know, you don't have to have a $4 billion bank, you know, mm. to be happy. Right. You know, I think uh, the, the true pleasures in life, the true satisfactions are really, they come from small things. Even Siggy, you know, with all of his wealth, the thing that made him happy was the birth of a child. He used to go to um, the Biltmore Hotel in Phoenix, Arizona, to walk through the flower gardens. They have 39 acres of sculpted flowers. He just loved being in nature. You know? wow. Small things um, that really give us the greatest pleasure. Well, I tell you, this is a wonderful book. I, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> to finish after our conversation, I will continue reading it. I wonder uh, if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can listeners follow you? Sure. Unstoppable, the story of Siggy Wilsig. If you go to Unstoppable Siggy, S-I-G-G-I, unstoppablesiggy.com. Otherwise, it's available to support your local bookstores. Uh, or if you're not near a local bookstore, you can buy it online. It's on all the websites online. Mr. Green, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you.